Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Shiny Side Out. With David and Mekki. <laughs> <laughs> He's David, I'm Mekki. <laughs> That's what he said. That's um, right. We're part of Revolution Radio on freedomslips.com. Join our show by joining us in the chat. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube to get updates between shows. Check out our website for up to date guest information and guest bios. And have a look through our previous shows. We'll also have a look. If you follow any one of those um, uh, mediums, you'll be able to pick up on our shows and get, even, you know, uh, ask us questions during the week. We'll answer them, yeah? Yes. And, and the key thing is we've got some awesome guests lined up, guys. We've had some awesome guests already. We had Jose Escamilla and Kara Cassidy, but we've got some uh, real uh, big hitters coming up soon. Could you give, him, give me a hint. Oh, okay. Uh, Lloyd Pye. Uh, Phil Coppins? <laughs> yep. Is that a hint? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that, that's a nice hint. I like that. Uh, we have uh, Judy Carroll coming up and Andy Thomas as well. So this is all in the next uh, two and a half months worth of shows. It's absolutely crazy. Um, and we've got Giorgio the Hare. All right, so we're looking forward to that. Look, if you're in the States and you want to call us up, uh, it's 347-688-2902. If you have Skype... And you want to call us up, add Freedom Screen with an N at the end. Add Freedom Screen to Skype. You should be able to join the show. But look, be patient. If you can't get through, it means the lines are jammed, right? We can only really take one call at a time on the audio line. We don't want to have too many people on, on board at the same time, all right? So just please be patient. Now, before we get started, um, we had this before, but I need to issue a public health warning, guys. <laughs> so bear, bear, pay attention, please. Uh, the entire show is a tinfoil head zone, okay? Please fasten your seatbelts, adjust your tinfoil heads, ensuring the shiny side is correctly facing outward, and keep your arms inside your LT suspension module at all times. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so... Yeah, because... And no flash photography. <laughs> no. <laughs> None of that. Um, look, tonight's show... Is necessary, I think, because this is probably one of the most, the, I guess, hotly disputed, debated, and passionately hated subjects, or loved, as it were, oh, that, yes. we will, that we will ever come across. Okay, we, We're going to talk about Hollow Earth, and by extension, we're going to talk about the Hollow Planets, Planet Formation, the Hollow Moon, and, and a whole bunch of things. Um, so this is, this is uh, going to be quite interesting, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, the, the reason why this came up was during the, the care we wanted to do the show, but we accelerated it forward because of when Kerry Cassidy was on, and we just mentioned the words Hollow Earth and Hollow Moon. The, the callers went berserk. We nearly melted down the switchboard, and, you know, it's something that we've all talked about, and very I've, I've listened to other programs, I've looked at the stuff out there, and there's very few people willing to talk about this. You know what, we are. We're not afraid to talk about stuff. Why not? Bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. You want to talk about it, you know, message us in chat. Tell yeah. us about topics you want us yeah. to and, and, and the thing is this, with this particular one, um, even even Dave and I, not not amongst ourselves, but just personally are um, unsure as to, as to exactly where this sits, because the evidence such as it is is, is extremely sketchy and, and, and highly disputed and highly debated. So we hope to shine a little light into your world uh, in, in this area, um, giving you some insights maybe that you haven't had, uh, because we've followed quite a few of the, the sources as far as we can uh, and found that some of them are credible, others are not, um, and we will highlight that in this show as well. Right. Yeah. Without further ado... <laughs> Um, let's 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 get started. And the way we wanted to start is this by looking at ancient history, legends, myths, and folk uh, folklore, because it is clear that um, the I guess the underground um, theme is is quite old. So I'm going to dive right in, Dave. Uh, look, yeah, look, absolutely. Look, I, I just wanted to because we have a, we do have a jam packed show. All mm. right. Mm. Once again, it's another two hours packed full of information. I'm going to get through it pretty quickly. So, look, please, I'll be pasting the links in. If Mech is talking, I'll be pasting. If I'm talking, he'll be pasting. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff to get through. But one of the things that's really important here, and which is every time we do this, we take you through the history, I want you just to realize that it's not... 
there are a lot of things in in mythology. I should I don't like mythology, but a lot of a lot of tales that come from a lot of, a lot of ancient cultures, it's which you cannot be ignored. Yeah, and this thing you should say that uh, it's a very Anglo-Saxon view of the world, and um, I'm not saying this in a, in a disparaging way at all. But, <laughs> but no, seriously, in Germany, uh, fairy tales are taken extremely seriously. You can go to university and study fairy tales. So you have a Bachelor of Fairy Tales, if you will, right? I mean, the study thereof. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is taken extremely seriously, these folk tales. And, and think about it this way as well. These are folk tales that have survived for hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of years. Can, can, I, can I correct you just for a minute? Let's sure. talk folklore. Folklore, sure. Folklore, folk not folk tales. A tale is something that may or may not be true for, in my respect, right? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting it down. And, oh. I, and I reckon this is something that, that we, we have to understand. Every other thing we've we've talked about has had some, some or if not all, of it is true, right? That is correct. So that's what you, so they're either based on the truth and they've been Chinese whispered or you know the, whatever you call it, um, a, a little a little different from the real story, but it's based in truth. So let's let's yeah. let's continue. Absolutely, there's always a kernel of truth. Uh, yeah, isn't that's it? It. But, but but in any event, so so what what do we have that that would um, support this? Um, I guess underground world as it were. So there's the Greek Hades, which is the, and the Romans had the same thing, which was the uh, shadow world uh, where you would go after you die. The uh, Nordic Svartalfheim, which is uh, similar, again. Could you say that again? Sure. Svartalfheim. <laughs> so you, you, you've got to be Northern European to say that correctly. And the Christian hell, of course, and the Jewish Shoal, okay, as described, uh, describing the inner earth in the Kabbalistic literature. And uh, same with Vedic texts, such as the Puranas, uh, and, and they actually talk about Shambhala. And if you remember, we've talked about Shambhala before. It is also a tradition of the Tibetan Buddhists, that mm -hmm. Shambhala is a city inside the earth where the immortals live, if you remember uh, from a previous show. That's right. And, and according to the Greeks, or the ancient Greeks, I should say, not the modern ones that are having so much trouble with the euro, they, uh, there were caverns under the surface which were entrances leading to the underworld. Okay, and some of these caverns, which are the entrances, uh, as far as the Greeks were concerned, were actually had, given with locations. So there was Tainaron in Laconia, there was Trosian in Argolis, Ephira in uh, Thesprotia, Heraclea in Pontos, and also in Ermione. So don't don't worry about uh, trying to uh, repeat that. In Thracian and Dacian legends, they also spoke about underground chambers, which were occupied by an ancient god called Zalmoxis. Okay, uh, the, Mesopotam uh, sorry, the Mesopotamians um, speak uh, of a man who, uh, after traveling through the darkness of a tunnel in the mountain of Mashu, entered a subterranean garden. Okay, in Celtic mythology, there's a legend of a cave called Kruachan, also known as Island's Gate to Hell. Okay, and this is a recurring motive, as you can see, that all these entrances to an underworld, to mm -hmm. a mythical underworld. Okay, or, interestingly, there's there's today a, an island in County Donegal in Ireland, which is called Station Island. Okay, that has a tunnel under a church which was closed in 1652, if memory serves correctly, and which is said to be one of those entrances. So if you ever get to County Donegal in Ireland and visit the Station Island, in fact. Uh, have a look if you can maybe break into that cavern under the church. Okay. Um, there's also uh, this is this uh, this uh, I'm taking a bit. Oh, I say I know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a bit further. There's also an ancient ancient legend of the uh, Angami Naga tribe of India that claimed that their ancestors, in fact, emerged in ancient times from a subterranean land inside the earth. And they're not the only ones. This is again a running motive through a whole bunch of ancient cultures that their ancestors somehow came from underground to populate the earth. Okay? It is so, yeah, that, and that's across the across the earth there's there's those tales, the same. Whether they're, they're sky people or underground people or the sky people fought with the underground people. Yep. Yeah. It's exactly right. Mm -hmm. In my in my homeland of Germany, um there is meant to be a mountain uh, that, that is located, and it's not named, unfortunately, between Eisenach and Gotha that holds a portal to the inner earth. Okay, and old Russians, so an old Russian legend states the same. An ancient Siberian tribe traveled to an underground cavern city to live inside the earth. Okay, in Native American mythology, same thing. Okay, in ancient times, the Mandan peoples are, are said to have emerged. 
near the Missouri River, in fact. Uh, there's also a tale about a tunnel in the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation, Arizona, near Cedar Creek, which is said to lead inside the earth to land inhabited by a mysterious tribe. So uh, there's more, okay? And they will be in the show notes, these references. There's a lot more, in fact. Um, and, and I'll put some books in as well. But I, I think what Dave and I want to do here is just to show you, this is... This is not a, an isolated incident. This, this is not one culture that talks about the underground or hell or Hades or whatever. It is almost every single culture that has some kind of relationship with some kind of underground world. Okay? A, quite a physical place which can be accessed through gateways, or, well, not gateways really, through caverns and gates um, on the surface. So there's a connection, a physical connection between the underground world and the upper world. Okay? So that, that's essentially what we wanted to show you here. Now, um, there's been quite a bit of uh, research done and, and uh, people have gone to certain places and, and stories come through that are believable and not so believable. And one of the most famous ones, which I just want to quickly mention here, is the um, a story of the Deros and the Teros, which uh, appeared in a pulp uh, magazine in the, I think it was the 40s and 50s, if I'm not mistaken, and that was purported to be fact but uh, presented as fiction and uh, chronicled the adventures of a, of a guy who actually went to this underground world of these, uh, 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 I guess, Terrace and Terrace, they're biological robots. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. Now, they're called the Shriver, the, Sh the Shriver Mysteries. And, again, uh, there will be reference to that as well. So let's, let's talk about, for a second, the, the actual structure of the planet Earth, the way we understand it, the way current scientific paradigm will have us believe it is, which is fair enough, too, I think. So I think one thing that everybody is not arguing on is the thickness of the Earth's crust. Okay, nobody's arguing how thick the Earth's crust is, which goes from about 35 kilometers uh, on average to, to a ma maximum thickness of 70 kilometers. Now, that's the hard stuff we, we live on, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's where we dig our coal up and the gold and the diamonds, okay? That's that nobody's disputing any of that, okay? Now, it, it, it varies... Okay, in, in, in certainly the ocean is, is uh, the ocean, oceanic crust is not as thick as the land crust, as you can imagine. Um, and, and in fact, the deepest point or the thinnest point of the crust is in the uh, Marianne Trench, uh, which is at, uh, 10 kilometers down from sea level. So that's the deepest place and also the thinnest place in the crust. Okay, so the way the crust is structured, or the mantle, I should say, so you've got, let's call it 70 kilometers of crust. Then you've got 2,900 kilometers of mantle. Okay, now this is, again, this is, this is somewhat a, a semi-solid material that people believe. And that's followed by the core, which has a, a depth of 3,500 kilometers. Okay, so the crust, the, the, the bit that we live on, you can see here, is quite thin, but, you know, almost negligible in comparison to the rest of it. Interestingly, though, the deepest hole that was ever drilled to date is the SG3 borehole, which is 12.3 kilometers or 7.6 miles deep and forms part of the Soviet Kola Superdeep Borehole Project. Okay? And that's the only visual knowledge of the Earth's crust to that depth that we have. That's it. Okay? Um, well, so, yep. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. So let, let, me, let me explain something else to you as well, and that is that the that earthquakes that are felt around the planet um, are, are bouncing around on the crust vi vi with vibration and through the mantle, mm -hmm. okay? We don't know. We only know that that medium is, appears denser or and that's it, but we don't know what is in the middle or the core. So, so, so far, with... With maths, we we know that there's 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 something a little deeper than the crust, but that's about it. The yes. rest is only guesswork because no signals go through the middle. So if an earthquake occurs exactly on the other side of the planet, you don't know. Mm. It doesn't make it all the way around. Mm. Exactly also, because there's nothing in the there's there's no way of knowing what's in the middle, and it doesn't transmit that energy from the earthquake. And that's right. And that was one of the problems they had with echo sounding as well. I mean, they have, of course, tried with, with ground penetrating echo sound to see what it looks like. All they can say is it is not as dense as the crust. Mm -hmm. That's really all we can say. Yeah. 
and they have they have and we're going to talk about the magnetic field in a little while, but they have to use that it must be in a semi-liquid state, maybe uh, because you know we have the magnetic field and it might be rotating counterclockwise to create that uh, magnetic field. Because as you know, if you if you rub hot metal together, what you get is a magnetic field. That's correct. That's right. so, so, but there are other explanations, potential explanations that could explain why that is happening. Uh, the liquid core is not the only one, right? So. Let's talk about gravity for a second. Okay, now, in, in traditional theory, which is accepted right now, uh, the center of gravity for the Earth is supposed to be at the center of the Earth, right? That seems to be like a common sense kind of thing. You know, that it is. For the hollow Earth theorists, they place the center of the gravity in the middle of the mantle. Yeah. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the essential difference here. Okay, so, and then we're going to talk about how the planets form and creation and so forth as well. Um, it, it's just... Um, uh, a little bit early, so let me talk, <laughs> let me talk to you about some of the hollow earth theories. Uh, Dave, do you want to take us quickly to uh, through maybe some of the um, prevalent or prevalent, I should say, uh, hollow earth theories today? I think there are about four or so that that uh, the hollow the hollow earth models that people follow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there's there's the the one. I, I'll tell you which one I like after. I'll just, I'll just launch them all, okay? So you've got the concentric spheres, hollow earth model, right? So if you were to look at it, it would look like cutting an onion in half across its axis, mm -hmm. all right? So that's concentric circles or concentric spheres. Uh, there's the polar holes earth model, mm -hmm. uh, which... We'll get into a bit later, but you also know that you know there's there's a hole the, the top and bottom and it's an entrance way. Um, inverted Earth, hollow Earth model, which is really a strange one, I think. But it's, it's I, I I know. I, it, see, I I like I like the the other one, the polar hole one, a bit more, a bit more. But you know, you won't hear that from me <laughs> <laughs> again. Okay, the complete shell hollow Earth model. Um, expanding Earth model. So, look, th those four, and I'll recap without without pause between them. Now, have a listen to them. Okay, so we've got concentric spheres, polar holes, inverted Earth, and complete shell. Oh, it, do, you, do you understand, guys? This is, <laughs> these, these models, um, opposed to the other, and the only one that's closer is the concentric spheres to what is in the textbooks. Correct. And, and rather than assuming that the mantle and the core are liquid or semi-liquid, yeah. what was supposed here is that the spheres are in fact as solid as the crust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, whichever one we choose to, to believe in, it still has to support a pole shift or a magnetic shift. You Think about that when you're making your choice listening to these. It is very important that whichever one you choose, it has to, because we know through magnetic records of fossils, sorry, of just rock, or magma from a, an active volcano, that there is a difference in magnetic field. So let's, let's think about that when you're, when you're listening to this as well. <sighs> Your turn. <laughs> okay, no worries. So, let, let me take you through these uh, theories in some detail just quickly. Now, the first one that Dave mentioned, which was the concentric cycles, was actually proposed by Edmund Haley. In 1692. Hey, I know that name. Yes, you do. Haley's Co Comet. Correct. Same, very same guy. So he's actually an astronomer of some renown, okay? Um, his ideas were developed while trying to understand the Earth's magnetic field. In order to explain the complex movements of the field, because remember, the Earth's magnetic field is not static, Halley included, uh, sorry, concluded that there must be at least four concentric shells, each with their own magnetic properties, okay? And the movement of each shell relative to the others allowed the distinctive areas of the field to move around. That made sense to him. So rather than assuming a liquid core, he assumed solid cores and solid mantle, okay? That was his, his main uh, contention. And in fact, most of the hollow earth theories are pretty much derived back from that, scientifically speaking, if you will. So that's sort of the first in modern times or semi-modern times that would, uh, uh, who would have started this kind of discussion. The hey, polar, sorry, go on. Yep. No, no. Hey, Mickey. We've just got a caller on the line. Oh, okay. And I, I wanted to know what, whether we've made a mistake. Can you pull us up? Hello, caller. Yes, please. Uh, hello, guys. Um, yeah, great show, and I love the hollow earth theory. 
But my question is, is why aren't we allowed to go to Antarct Antarctica? <laughs> Antarctica, sorry, having trouble speaking. Um, you're absolutely not allowed. Um, the last I heard is Brooks Agnew is on an expedition there, and he's gotten permission, I think, from a Russian vessel. Okay. And he he's in the process right now of traveling to Antarctica. And I've also heard that Antarctica has um, tropical places, too. Like, there's been reports of greenery and... I don't know if that's in, in that fact, adds anything. You're referring, yeah, you're referring to the, um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, about the report that Admiral uh, Byrd uh, yep. was meant to have broadcast or, or spoken about uh, in his 1947 flight. There have also been other um, uh, reports of, of warm air and driftwood coming from the north and the south. So, yes, we, we're aware of this. Um, now, I can, as far as the uh, no goes on for Antarctica is concerned, it is a, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a zone claimed by, all, by many nations, uh, the United States, Australia, South America, or South American nations, I should say, even mm -hmm. Russia tries mm -hmm. to lay claim. And so it is, it, is, it is, I think, difficult to get there. Um, I know that you can actually go on tours. There are tours from Australia, tourist tours that, that go to the, uh, to the South Pole. I don't know if you're actually allowed to go to the South Pole as such. You can visit Antarctica to some extent, but I think that might be somewhat limited as to where you can actually in, go. In fact, in fact, the, the limitation, um, you're bound to stay on ship, not make landfall. Right. All right. However, um, with permission, with permission, remember, remember like, he, Mickey's right, it's split up into uh, bases, um, representing different countries around the world. You just don't want to step on the wrong base. And there's no fences or anything, okay? So, yeah, I have to, I have to agree and disagree at the same time. Uh, there's a whole show on Antarctica yes. that's coming up, that's coming up um, and it's to do with, you know, the pre-World War II actions between two countries uh, in particular, which we'll, we'll get more on about that show. But thank you very much, caller, for your call. Brilliant. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. No worries. Uh, okay, cool. um, no, th and again, please call in, guys. Uh, we're, we're happy to, to take on anything. And, and if we do make a mistake, please, please pull us up on it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's what this is about. Okay. Um, now, this is the, the Polar Holes Hollow Earth model is the most famous one. You would have seen pictures of a hollow sphere Earth with a, a, a tiny sun on the inside. You, you would have seen that, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and essentially... Um, this, this, this theory postulates there would be huge polar holes that could be in the vicinity of two to 4,000 kilometers across that open to the interior of the planet. Okay, now, uh, at this stage, we have, some, we have seen some photography, uh, satellite photography, not just of the Earth, but of other planets as well, that, that seem to indicate that may be a possibility. I'm, I'm choosing my words very carefully here, okay, because I, I can't confirm or deny any of this, I've got no primary evidence that would lead me to believe that uh, any of this is in fact 100% fact. But uh, we want to put the theories out here. There, there seems to be some indicative evidence that this is true. Now, there is also the inverted Earth hollow, um, inverted Earth hollow Earth model. Mm -hmm. now, what, what, what do we mean by this? Okay, this, this is interesting. So essentially, we are living on the inside of a sphere like a Dyson sphere, okay, only much, much bigger. So a Dyson sphere is essentially a shell that an advanced civilization can build around the sun uh, in order to harvest and harness all the energy that the sun uh, outputs. Now, so that, that's a level three civilization that Michio Kaku talks about. Correct. And, and, and it, this, is, this is not, uh, right, I mean, today, of course, it is science fiction. Having said that, though, it makes sense to break up all the planets of the solar system and form that shell. And if you did all that, I think you could just build a shell in, in the orbit that you needed around whenever the sun. You, whenever you wanted, wherever you wanted. Correct. <laughs> so it, it, it really is a level three. It would be an amazing technological feat. A lot of science fiction has been written about it, um, and it, it, I find it a fascinating speculation. So, so think of Dyson Sphere now when we talk about the inverted Earth, hollow Earth model. Now, we are living on the inside shell, okay, but the center of that shell is infinitely far away. So when you're looking up into the sky, you're not actually looking out, but you're, you're looking, looking in. in. That's right. You're looking in billions and billions and billions of light years, okay? So that is the inverted Earth, hollow Earth model. So you ask yourself, well, if we keep digging, what do we get to when we come out the other side, right? The outside. 
I have no idea. <laughs> so, but you know what? We warned you. Keep those tinfoil hats on. You really yeah. need it. Yeah, but but I've got to with you, this is probably the most outlandish idea I've heard <laughs> in, in relationship to the whole That's, world. But, but you know sorry what? Sorry I'm laughing. I respect everyone's ideas. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe. I mean, you know, it's, it's, Who like, knows? it's like when you watch The Simpsons, right? And they all go to hell. Like, it's, it's Judgment Day. And then uh, God comes out and he goes, ah, well, you know what? The Jews got it right. <laughs> Hot dog, you know? <laughs> So, you know, I mean, you just don't know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know, but we certainly know what we don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. In this case. And, and then there's another one, and this is the one, and uh, this information I've taken from a site, which is in fact called the Complete Shell Hollow Earth Model, uh, The Land with No Horizon, which is actually a very interesting book, and I, rec I recommend it to anyone. And I've, I've put the, um, uh, I, I will put the um, uh, link in, into the uh, notes as well. So this is talking about the expanding Earth. Right. There's a theory out there that says the Earth is in fact expanding. So it started smaller than it is today. Okay? And and over time, over the last you know, billions of years it has grown. So rather than continental drift, we've had continental expansion. Or or not so much expansion, but an expansion of the outer mantle which has pushed the continents further apart. Okay, now uh, the, the common theory is that it has continental drift and that's why they've split apart. And, and there's subduction, which means plates go under, and there's um, the opposite where plates come up. And, and so that's the accepted theory, and this theory now postulates, no, that's not true. What in fact is happening is the Earth is actually getting bigger like a balloon that you're blowing up. Also expanding the interior. But by expanding, the hollow at the center of the Earth gets bigger. Okay? So, so there's, there's a civilization with potentially as well inside the Earth, that, uh, that is expanding with uh, the Earth as it uh, gets more, ma uh, sorry, more area, more surface area mm -hmm. across. Now, this, this is interesting, um, and, and there, seems to be, there seems to be quite a bit uh, that, that, that supports this, as strange as this may sound, right? We're talking about an expanding universe, guys, okay? So I need you to think about that as well. So there was a Big Bang that, uh, according to theory, started it all, and ever since then, the universe has been expanding. Now... The first question that came to my mind is, what is it expanding into, right? That's, that's really something I, um, well, you know, whatever. Explanation is empty space. Correct. Well, that's right. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know. So, so the, the uh, expanding, the expanding uh, Earth is, is not really that far-fetched if you look at the expanding universe. Okay? I just want to put that out there. So um, the hollow planet structure uh, can explain many mysteries, apparently such as the impact crater characteristics on terrestrial planets, the mysterious red spot on Jupiter, seismic wave data from earthquakes, and, and uh, other things as well, including the floods on Mars. An expanding Earth provides the driving force behind the drifting continents, mountain building, and earthquakes, and is also accountable for changing the value of gravity over time. And, and we know that gravity is actually not a constant. Okay? And in fact, it's a much weaker force and here we go into dark matter, I guess, mm -hmm. then it should be. Now, for example, magnetism, right, is a lot stronger than gravity because guess what? If you've got an iron nail and you've got a tiny magnet, you can pick it up. If you can pick it up, you're acting directly against gravity. Okay. However, if you have no gravity, say, in your coffee cup, with the same mass as a nail leak, that it is gravity it relational That's to correct. it. Even so, in space, even in space, so, they will not do it. See, isn't that, but isn't that fascinating though, right? I mean, so there's something going on here, and again, we haven't quite gotten to that, okay? And it's not the first time people have been surprised also about the amount, or the, the lack or minuscule amount of gravity. You mentioned it there, but I had to bring this out as a little mm. bit, I'm mm. sorry. The, oh, please. the amount that physicists are still today curious about how small that signal is, how small it is. Even though we're attracted to the Earth and we're small, it's big. The sun is even bigger, I mean, absolutely enormous, but the center of the universe, sorry, the center of the galaxy, the mass, supermassive black hole there, has enough mass to accumulate uh, all, of, sorry, equalize all of the stuff spinning around it. And yet we all hang in there despite the great distances. Yes. We know that two atoms are attracted to each other. We know, but it's, it's so small, these figures. It's like a single atomized drop of water as an attraction power against the ocean, right? 
It's so, I, I, I don't think I can explain it the way I think about it, but it is actually very, very small indeed. It's so small, in fact, that um, I, I'm just going to... I'm just going to leap ahead for one second. Leap, leap. <laughs> um, I, I said this in a, in a previous show as well, and that is that one of the Mythbusters episodes where they were trying to detect something, the, um, they had a machine from the university there, and they were trying to uh, replicate this experiment over and over again to see if they had any anti-gravity effect. And, in fact, all the variations they were recording were just there anyway, the variations of gravity. They had to have this machine. It's so expensive because we don't have a machine that can really monitor gravity while it's affected by it. And affected by a gravity, it's got mass, the machine's heavily heavy. So it's very, very slight. It, it, all, all of the things we're talking about here tonight, I, I swear, all are based around one complexity, that we are attracted to the Earth and we're in orbit around a sun, mm-hmm. right? And gravity is the center of the whole thing. Not the center of the Earth, but it's the it's the clue here. I think between everything that's going to allow us to make a decision. And, and it is still, oddly enough, you know, one of the least understood forces <laughs> in, in in our scientific knowledge. Um, and it, we haven't really moved along on that. You know, everybody thinks it's way too weak. There has to be a lot more mass mm-hmm. in the universe to account for gravity. And again, Dave is right. It, it, I think it's 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 the linchpin. For uh, probably unified field theory, but that's that's probably another show or two. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's there's one more theory, sorry Dave, that I would like to mention, which is not directly related to hollow earth. It is on the fringes, and that's by um, a very interesting man by the uh, name of Charles Hepgood. Charles Hepgood uh, wrote a series of books. Uh, the first one being the Earth's Shifting Crust, which was published in 1958. Yep. And, and he coined what is today called crustal displacement theory. Uh, th- in fact, uh, he got Einstein to write the foreword for his book. So, so Einstein was quite taken by the idea. Now, this idea predates continental drift. Okay? Yep. And, and I'm not saying his idea is the correct one, but uh, he would essentially assume that the Earth's crust can move around the mantle. We discussed this uh, in accepted theory, the mantle is semi-liquid. Uh, at will, like a, like an orange would move around, like the orange peel would move around the, the fruit inside if, if you were able to dis- dislodge it, and which of course would be catastrophic. And he he also believes in catastrophism, which means uh, catastrophic changes uh, every now and again uh, to the global uh, ecology and, and 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 flora and fauna and so forth, killing thousands if not millions of species, changing the uh, configuration of the poles, all of which we know has taken place. So he, he took his uh, he took his evidence from from the physical evidence that was available. So that, it's important to to keep that in mind. And and a hollow Earth uh, theory does not necessarily uh, contradict Charles Hepgood because again nobody is arguing that there's a crust. All we are trying to figure out here is what is underneath the crust. Yeah, what's beneath it? Exactly right. Yeah. Now now his uh, the reason why Einstein 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 was on board uh, with Hepgood there was and I know this one in depth right. Beautiful. He, Einstein realized that the crust itself would become magnetized as you can magnetize a nail with a, with a magnet. Mm-hmm. So you can create a north and south pole by running the magnet along the nail's length a number of times, and just like you do with the metal screwdrivers, they can pick up things you drop inside machines. That's what I do. Exactly. Right? So you can, you can magnetize the metal, and that's a lining up all of its north and south, so that instead of being random and having no magnetic field, you can actually magnetize it. So he believed, this is Einstein, saw the information, and he loved it because he realized that the pole shift themselves, which he was in favor of, um, having occurred already and about to reoccur, was literally because the outer crust became magnetized because of this rotational magnetic field on the inside, and then became opposite to it. So once you've once you've magnetized something, it's now going to be it's going to be influenced by the thing that caused it. So north becomes south, and south becomes north. Bingo! And then it just does it again, and so on and so forth over time. So it it, it support it, this that the theory supports um, the entire model of pole shift mm-hmm. or pole change. But what happens is the skin or the crust of the earth being 
over to, able to float over the mantle in Hapgood's theory, it was meant to just be able to roll over the top. Mm-hmm. So the inside didn't change in respect to the sun because that would be bad yes. and it would be very hard to change except for the outer skin. It all seems so valid to Einstein who has just solved the universe <laughs> with all his <laughs> equations. He went, bingo, that's, that's it. I, I didn't even know why I didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Correct. And, and the thing is this, so when you've got this massive shift Occurring though, let's say this this mantle slips. I think the movie 2012 and the catastrophic changes that was brought about. By mm-hmm. it. So it, we're talking about something like that. So it's not just a gentle slide across across the mantle as it were. And we sit so, down and have a picnic. Yeah. And, and watch the sun go across the sky the wrong way. And... Exactly, because there's there's displacement, there's inertia, there's there's currents both in the air and in the water. So it, think of when you when you're shaking a bucket of water. Okay, or when you move it very quickly, right? That water moves, and when you stop, all of a sudden, that water keeps moving. It keeps moving. The, <laughs> okay. the scene on twenty twelve, when the the sea comes over the over the mountains, and that the fellows ringing the good the gong. Exactly. Right. Picture yes. that because that is also what happened over the Andes. That is also what all of the ancient cultures are all talking about. They've all mentioned this great flood. They didn't say the, water, the sea level just slowly rose up and they all went, oh, okay, let's move to high ground. It's time to go to high ground. No, there was this great inundation. In some places it rained a lot. Mm. But in, in, in the most of the part, it really was all to do with that sudden inundation or the sudden stopping of the, of the earth in its turning or the sudden inclination of it moving, right? Mm-hmm. So, 100%. Now... So, so it's, it's catastrophic scenarios, no matter which way you tilt it in. And, and we do know for a fact that these catastrophes, sorry, catastrophes have taken place in, in the Earth's past and may again in the future. Now, what we would like to jump to now is we, we have a large section on Admiral Byrd, which, which I would like to push toward uh, a, b- a bit further, Dave. Sure. So I, would like, I would like to go to uh, planetary formations um, and, and how we think uh, planets form. And because this is not just... Looking at the Earth, it's looking at the Moon, it's looking at, at Mars and other planets. And um, a, a, at the end of this whole, we, we have a news article from 2011, which uh, we bring up in the end, which will show that we may have to revisit our ideas about how planets and solar systems are in fact formed. Because what we find out there doesn't correspond to with what we have in our solar system. How about that? Nice. So, <laughs> so we've got the hollow planet history, and this was taken again from, from the side, which was brilliant, and I, we were going to put that in there as well, the link. Uh-huh. Um, so essentially, let, let me take you through this, and Dave, please please chime in with the, um, with the uh, current data as well for, for planet yeah, formation yeah, no and how we, how we think that all works. So, so Sir Edmund Haley, we've, we've already mentioned him, right? The most controversial theory, or his most controversial theory, is origin from the study of magnetism, right? We've spoken about that already, mm-hmm. how he thought that in, in this, the spheres inside would, would, would uh, create this magnetic field around the Earth, okay? So that's what he uh, speculated. And um, he also speculated on whether or not there would be life inside these shells, right? Since, in, in, don't forget, those were religious times, and, and it, most of these people were, were deeply religious. So since God had created animate beings, which inhabited every part of the Earth as we know it, why should he not therefore have also caused the interior of these shells to be inhabited? That was his thought process, okay? He thought there might be small suns inside the Earth, peculiar luminaries below of which we have no sort of idea. That's what he called them in his own words, okay? And many of the core features, as we mentioned, of the hollow Earth were born out of Halley's speculation. However, could, could that actually be true, right? Now, today... It goes like this. Scientists believe stars and planets formed from huge clouds of dust in space. That's, that's pretty much where they state, right? Yep. And, and gravity caused them to condense. Right? That's, that's where we are. Yeah, so, so you, get, you get a couple of things that, that clump together. They've got more gravitational attraction than the other things. But, you know, what we're talking about this is very small. Yes. And they'll attract other ones until there's a gap of their attraction versus what material they could attract and that's pretty much it, right? Yes. But yes. We've, we've spoken about this again, and everything in space spins. Yes, correct. Everything. You, know, you name it, right? You let go of a spanner, it'll spin. Yes. Right? It'll eventually spin. It'll actually spin up because of the other influences around it, that which are all spinning, which all have, you know, like the galactic plane or the solar system plane, you, you name it. 
Correct. Just take it. <laughs> oh, sorry. So everything spins, right? And yeah. Eventually, it turned, this, this spinning cloud turned into spheres, right? Now, bear with me. If this is the case, then like an ice skater, now think of an ice skater on the ice, these stars and planets would have spun faster as they contracted. So you've, as you've seen this, an ice skater has his arms and leg out, he spins fairly slowly. He That's right. moves, then closer to his body, he spins faster. And yeah. likewise, if he puts them back out again, he goes slower again. Correct, and this is actually the law of conservation of angular momentum. Okay? That's it's correct. A law, and that's it's it's what it is, right? However, <laughs> the solar Tim system. Hat, guys. Yeah. yeah, no, no, this is no, no, this is a fact. The solar system tells a different story. Now, the Earth. Now, in, in this theory, the smallest planets should spin the fastest, right? But in fact, it's the largest one that spins faster. So the Earth rotates twenty four every twenty four hours. Correct. Every twenty four hours goes around around itself. Yep. Every 24 hours. Jupiter, the largest planet, 10 times the size of Earth, does it in 10 in hours. 10 hours. Okay? This is not what one would expect from condensed solid planets. Now, we know it's a gas giant still. It is, it is that much bigger. So, what, what uh, can we... The, the smaller size, okay? Slower rotation, bigger size. Faster rotation, the relationship of planets and stars, rotations, exactly what you think if planets and stars were created hollow. Now, if these planets were hollow, then it makes sense. Are you are you with me, guys? So, if if, if this if 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 the smaller planets are solid, then it doesn't make sense. If they are hollow, and in fact all of the planets are hollow, then this does make sense. Because think about this way, right? If you spin something, right? And if you, you've got the, you've got the hollow or any any gas cloud, there's nothing at the center. Everything, because that's the centrifugal forces. They push everything to the outside. I, I've, I've got to, I've got to explain. So, okay, so you've you're in a room, and it's filled with air. There's no reason for any of the air to clump together. Correct. Right. Let's consider a gas cloud or a dust cloud or something in space where there's no other influences. They it just it is still remains a gas cloud. It's still it, nothing actually starts to condense. Yes. No. All mathematical exercises show that if one could suspend an object at the center of the Earth, it would be weightless. Okay, so we know that, okay? And where, so when, when a planet is formed, when a forming planet rotates, rather, the matter at its core will be flung away from the center. Okay? Mm -hmm. Gravity, however, increases as one moves away from the center of a planet because there's more matter below. So a point is reached whereupon gravity is stronger than the centrifugal force and the expansion stops. One thus ends up with a hollow spinning sphere. So it's, it's, it's actually, it makes sense. It's intuitive, right? But, but our solution or our accepted model today is counterintuitive because you have to, okay, let me, let me put it this way. You've got a whole bunch of dust, okay, and it spins and it spins and it condenses, right? But it will condense in a spherical shape. Try it. In fact, if you have the laboratory set up, try it, try it at home. <laughs> <if you can. laughs> that's right. If you, can, if you can get anti-gravity in a dust cloud, yeah, yeah go ahead. That's it. And it. But the thing is this. It takes a lot of pressure, okay, a lot of pressure for something dense to form, okay? And the question here in my mind is, Dave, where did the pressure come from to form this liquid molten core of what we think is iron at the center of the Earth? All right. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you this is the current thinking, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, as <laughs> this, is, this is pretty tough because, there's, there yes, there's a lot of iron out in there. There's dust clouds and everything, which... Um, uh, I lean on the Carl Sagan description. We all have, we're all made of star stuff. When a star explodes, it's usually because it was had an iron core. It had less um, hydrogen to burn, less hel helium to burn as it gets older, until it can no longer sustain under pressure the core that was crushed by all of the other stuff. And you you have to think about it. Our sun's actually getting smaller. Believe it or not, yeah. Every single day, there's trillions and trillions of tons of material that's being blown away, which is called the, the solar wind, all right? That material is just leaving, and you've got ejections that are from the sun. You can't imagine that that could last forever. Well, in fact, it doesn't, and I believe the age of the sun is, a, is much older. Don't get me started on that. That's a whole other story. And the people, the scientists still currently today think that the sun was created at the beginning, and that, that is impossible, impossible if we've got rocks that are older than the sun, right? Where'd they come from? They mm -hmm. come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, 
you've got a lot of iron content. You've got a lot of stuff that gets clumped together. Imagine if you could physically clump them to start with, right? I'm going to ignore the, the fact that they, it's very tough for things. Like, why didn't the asteroid belt turn into a planet? Again. <laughs> right? Well, aha. <laughs> Again, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so once things start to clump together, you're going to have an attraction, an attractive gravity force upon them all. They'll eventually cause something so large that it'll crush the inside bits and make it hot. Once it becomes molten, that heat gets pushed out, and you end up with a molten core. It's purely from the mass and the gravitational force. We understand that there's pressure and there's heat from the pressure. Even though the space is cold, it's minus 273 degrees, it, you're still going to have this temperature on the inside, right? Right. That's the theory. That's the current theory around it. Now, as it's doing this, for some reason, it spins up. That's right? it. And, now, and, well, <laughs> it's, the, it's the influence of its rotational angle um, around the sun. It's, it, it could form on its own in the middle of nowhere. It probably won't spin, right? right. But influence, influential angle uh, around, angle of incidence around the, uh, its trajectory around the sun, and it's going to spin... Uh, one side will be closer than the other. We know that they're different lengths of movement, and you will get spin. But this is the problem I still have with this. What we just heard is right. Doesn't it make sense? How do you make cotton candy? A cotton candy machine spits stuff out of the center. Yep. It's spinning around. Does it stay in the center? No, it goes out as far as it can. In fact, think of any vortex. Any vortex. Every vortex is hollow. Yep. A, vir a whirlpool, a tornado, a hurricane, eye of the storm, right? Yep. So by, by, by its very definition, things that get flung by the centrifugal force on the outside. Sorry, go on, Dave. No, no, you're absolutely right. So like, I'm, I'm, supporting, I'm supporting the, the hollowness of the center, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to have, and, and, I, and this, the other thing is, he's right about when he's talking about in the center of the mass, you're less attracted to the whole of the mass and you're attracted to other components. So in the center, you, are, you have no gravity, right? Because you're attracted to everything else, which is a, around you, away from you, and so, you, in fact, you have no gravity. So the, the, the centrifugal force or centrifugal force should pull that away from the center. Mm -hmm. if you're, unless you're at the exact center, which is only a small into infinitesimal point, but everything else around that in the molten area should actually stay outward. And like, and it, I've always said this, right? And I'm making this observation right here, right now. I'm going to do a Darren Hinge, right here, <laughs> right now. I'm going to say it live. Shame, on, shame, 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 shame. Um, <laughs> sorry, an Australian guy. Um, the outward force of the solar wind is keeping away the rest of the galaxy from us. Mm -hmm. Right, there's an inward, inward force being applied against our solar system, and the sun's solar wind is actually pushing down. That makes sense. That's the same kind of thing that I imagine would be on the inside of the Earth. Hmm. That's actually very interesting. That's, that's, hey right. guys, you heard it here first. An outward pressure keeping it away, making a hollow space. It supports it. Yes, absolutely. Back to you. <laughs> oh, uh, look, uh, look, and, and, and yes, see, this. It, so the thing is, this it's, 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 it's extremely complex. A lot of people have have opinions. The truth is, nobody, nobody has gone to the center of the Earth. Not even Jules Verne. Okay, so we, we haven't gone there. We we don't really know. We we have got a lot of theories, and that's that's really what science is all about. But we shouldn't discount something just because it seems ridiculous. Uh, I mean, how ridiculous would it be to assume that? The, uh, the sun is, in fact, not the center of the universe, or, in fact, our Earth is not the center of the universe. You know, these were our one's ideas that, that were considerably ridiculous. You know so, what? That, that yeah. is so true. And that's the, what we're trying to say here is the planet creation theory is as valid a theory as a hollow Earth theory, or instead of a solid core, you have a hollow core. It yeah. makes no difference. No. no difference, because one, we haven't been to the core to see if it's real, yep. if it's there solid or not. And two, the other one's still a theory too. We've never seen a planet get made. 
Yeah. And, and I want you guys to remember something before, before I go on. Um, it's called the theory of evolution, the theory of gravity, quantum theory. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, not uh, relativity fact or quantum fact or evolution fact. Mm-hmm. So these are all just uh, working theories. And, and the more we know, and, and make no mistake, we are not nowhere near the end of our knowledge. Nowhere near, okay? We, we're on the road somewhere, uh, which is good. But I think it, we just got in the car. We did. <laughs> we, we're taking a trip. Yeah. So I, I want to go on to, to hollow moons and potentially other hollow planets, though. Awesome. Um, so and, uh, this, this was taken uh, from, a, from a website as well, which we found, um, uh, which, which much more eloquently summarizes what we want to say. So I'm going to give this to you in total. So the idea of hollow planets seems to have found a home for itself among Russian scientists, okay, more than anybody. Twice they have suggested that planetary bodies might be hollow. The first was the suggestion that one of the moons of Mars might be hollow, and I think it was Phobos. The second was when two senior scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences, as it was known then, now it's of course no longer there, the Soviet Union is gone, suggested <laughs> That's that That's what moon... they want you to think. <laughs> Aha! <laughs> oh, Dave. <laughs> so I'm just sorry. Now... <laughs> My hat's on. I... <laughs> I know, you had to say it. I walked into that one. Um, <laughs> suggested, uh, suggested that our moon was in fact hollow. Okay, so in the mid 1970s, Vasin and Sherbakov, don't try to say that at home, I'm a trained professional, from the Soviet Academy of Sciences suggested that the moon was a huge alien spaceship. Now, these are respected Russian scientists, right? Hang on. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I hear you. Keep going. Yeah, no one really knows how the moon came into being, and we've discussed the moon to some extent. I think there should be another show on the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the moon and Earth form together in orbit, why are the surface materials of these two worlds so dissimilar? Okay, why are there some rocks found on the moon which might be older than the ones on Earth? And we've discussed this to some extent, and Jose has mentioned that as well. Absolutely. When we get him the show. So perhaps, perhaps, perhaps the moon came from elsewhere, perhaps. Perhaps even from outside our solar system, right? Many scientists have suggested uh, just that. But here, Newtonian gravity becomes the problem. So gravity, again, our old friend, becomes the problem. How is that? According to all calculations and models produced by scientists, the chances of a successful capture of the moon by the Earth as a mere random event is about one in one billion. So you have a better chance of winning lots of guys than capturing the moon. So how, how could the Earth have captured the moon against such jobs? Well, it couldn't, I guess. And that is why these two Russian scientists suggested that the moon was steered, steered into orbit by intelligent beings. And we will have a moon show. We will. We and will. Certainly, certainly once Jose, and, and in honor of Jose's new documentary, uh, Moon Rising. Yep, it's a, it's a, yep, which which was an ex- expansion of, of of the moon rising country, uh, which will happen on the uh, anniversary of, of the, July. Yep, the moon landing anniversary. Hundred percent correct. So we will certainly have a have a show on the moon f- uh, for that, and maybe have Jose in the studio if we can. Oh, mm-hmm. there's no studio. There's just me in a room and Dave in a room somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, perhaps they were in fact steered, like we said, by intelligent beings. Pe- 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 perhaps they are no longer there. Perhaps they are still living inside the moon. So. Why a hollow moon then? Okay, this is, this is coming back to another show we spoke about. Apollo 12 placed the first seismometer. Now, a seismometer is a, an apparatus that picks up, um, I guess, shocks in the Earth's crust. Okay? Seismic shocks. Correct. Seismic now, so, waves. Exactly. So when you talk about the Richter scale and, you know, when somebody draws on these nice diagrams with a needle, that's actually a seismometer. Okay? So, on an alien world. So they placed it on an alien world. Wow. So, and what was the alien world? The moon, of course. NASA did not expect many moon quakes. They expected the moon to be seismically dead. Okay, no activity. Now, to ensure some kind of seismic results, they deliberately caused part of a rocket to crash into the moon. When they did this, and I think this will become familiar to you, the results astounded all the theorists, or all the the theoretical scientists. The moon's behavior was quite unexpected. And wait for it. It rang like a bell for almost an hour. Oh, so, oh I love that phrase. <laughs> you, know that, you know that guy's holding his head in his hands right now going, I should never have said that, right? Oh, he's going, if he said, oh, we, we discovered that there was some seismic waves, it <laughs> wouldn't have had the, I don't know, the media, no. the media charm that, uh, that does. But oh, my goodness. We, we, we detected some oscillations in the crust. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
No, no, he said it, it rang like a bell. Now, scientists were quite stunned at the time. It, it, may, interest the real, it may interest you guys to know that in 1959, a prominent Russian astronomer produced spectrographs showing what he believed was a volcanic eruption, which he detected on the moon. Okay? There is indeed activity on the moon, uh, or more activity than, than we would have thought. Okay? So, so we, 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 we just don't know what's going on there. Also, we know now, now we know, that moonquakes occur with clockwork regularity, so they're predictable. Hang on, but, th but there was a second um, uh, artificial uh, piece of junk that NASA threw at it as well, huh? which was a couple of tons, and it rang for three hours. So yeah. th there was two incidences. They did it the first time, and were completely taken aback by their findings, by the outcome, and the way, oh, we're going to do it again. But where did they do it? Do you remember where they, they sent that poor, uh, hapless probe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At full speed? speed? Uh, sorry, say again, the speed? At full speed? Oh, yes, oh, absolutely, absolutely. They sent it to the South Pole. The South Pole of the Moon, they hit that damn thing as hard as they could as fast as they could with the heaviest thing they had in space that they could get onto it, right? Mm -hmm. With its sole intention of finding out what, what there was. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Now, that's not the end of the moon. That's not the end of the moon stories, but that's certainly... Oh, not by a long stretch, guys. Not, not by, by not, even, not even close. <laughs> but, but they, likewise, it kept ringing and ringing and ringing, and they kept seeing this thing for three hours. Now, uh, everyone that we've talked to and every physicist says that does not make sense. If you hit a solid object with something, certainly something that has dirt and rock, right, with something that's only a couple of tons, it's a third the size of the Earth, for, for goodness sakes, right? That's exactly right. If, if something, maybe, I don't know, if a 30-ton object fell to Earth, you wouldn't feel it. You just wouldn't feel it anywhere. Oh. It was you feel it locally in the area. You go, oh, what was that? And that's pretty much the end of it, right? H having said that, though, and, and I need to say this as well, uh, you're right if it was accelerated from the moon to the Earth, and it also depended on the speed at which it would hit. But so, you know, if it didn't reach terminal velocity or even close to the speed of light, then, then uh, you're quite right. It would just be absorbed by the mantle and there would be not much of a thing. Uh -huh. But if it came at anything approaching, uh, you know, significant speed... We, we would certainly feel it. Oh, yeah. So, but uh, having said that, NASA obviously did not have the wherewithal to, to accelerate their probe to close to light speed, right? <laughs> well, well, let me put it this way. They, they certainly didn't show us that ability in that particular instance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, and, uh, sorry, Dave, we're coming up to the uh, bottom. Top of the hour. Top of the I still can't get that right. We're coming to the top of the hour, guys. Um, don't go away, though. We will discuss hollow planets after, and we will also talk a little Dr. about... Dr. Bird? Yeah, well, Admiral, really. Uh, but, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was, yeah that's all good. Um, and, 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 I want, and the reason we're going to mention him is because of the high level of controversy. And uh, just to give you a bit of a hint, I personally, and I don't know about Dave, I have not... I oh, know, you did so well. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you're listening to this on YouTube or you're listening or you're in the chat right now, say hi. I'm just going to run through some names. So you know that when you're listening to our show online, it's live, we're live, you can chat to us, and we'll even bring up topics and ask, answer questions as well while we're talking a bit off air in the chat room. So you're really getting a value experience. So join us by joining us in the chat, join the show, follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook to get updates between shows, and check out our website for up-to-date guest information, guest bios, previous shows, show notes, and YouTube links. Okay, I'm just going to run through some people in the chat room just before we get on. So we've got Acid, Jerbear, Just in Time, there's us, Hawk, looks like he's gone to bed, uh, RBN, Tangy, Tones, Hey Tones, Warfpo is there, um, Amanda Mays, Hovey, Hey Hovey, Mother Show, and Petrov. And, Welcome, uh, guys, and hello. If anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead, guys. All right, so what, what do we get? Now, we, we're talking about Hollow Moon and Hollow Earth. That's correct. So, so um, we, we have, of course, uh, certain theories on how this happens. We've discussed this. 
Um, it seems, though, that there seems to be some evidence as well that Mars certainly is one of the moons of Mars. Other planets potentially have uh, some kind of properties of hollow planets, you know. Uh, odd pictures that were taken of areas near the poles, which could conceivably be holes, uh, entrances to the um, inner uh, planet, as it were. Um, there have been stories about the Earth and its uh, inner I guess, um, life, uh, potential in a sun. Uh, and, and one of the most uh, most often quoted all right, uh, evidence uh, uh, components is Admiral Byrd. Okay? This is uh, uh, Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who was born in 1888 and died in 1957. He was an intrepid Antarctic explorer. Um, he claims to have flown over the North Pole in 1926 and a whole bunch of things. I'm just going to quickly go through his bio, if you will. So he, uh, the, the first Antarctic expedition uh, was, uh, or took place from 1928 to 1930, and uh, the second one from 1933 to 35, and then the last, the third one, I should say, rather, from 1939 to 41. As you can see, it was right in the middle of uh, a massive upheaval uh, globally, you know, it's the outbreak of, uh, or the lead up to World War II. And in fact, he wasn't the only one that was going to have the Antarctic. The Nazis had uh, expeditions going down there to um, Neuschwabenland, and, and everybody was in a race to, to the poles for some reason. So it was quite a hectic time for Arctic and Antarctic explorers. Now, this, was, nice, this wasn't awesome. just, this was not, oh, sorry, this, this is um, the race for explorers, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So, and he also was took took part in, uh, of two operations, or took part or led two operations: the 1946 Operation High Jump mm -hmm. and the 1955 to 56 Operation Deep Freeze. Now, I will not go into those. No, um, not this show. Not this show, because this is a whole different show on its own. Okay? Yeah. And um, he was. Uh, one thing I will say: uh, it seems that the Rockefellers financed quite a bit of his work. Okay, that's all I have to say at this point on that. So he, he actually was yeah, financed by those guys, interestingly. Now, the controversy, like nobody disputes what, that, even that, originally, what I just it, said, that actually. Even originally in the 1926, uh, or the 90, yeah, 1926 flyover, yes. that wasn't the record for Rockefellers at that point, though, was it? Oh, no, no, not at that point. Yeah, okay. It started a bit later, correct. Right. Now, having said that, though, uh, and... Um, so what I just mentioned, these expeditions and, and operations, nobody disputes happened. Everybody knows that yep, that's and it was hard, yeah, and it was it was real hard work and uh, dangerous to boot, and, and some people got lost, but it, nobody says that didn't happen. Where it becomes interesting, and and um, I will get into this particular piece of evidence in some detail, is what happened in, or allegedly happened in 1947. Okay. In apparently, or allegedly, in a radio broadcast, Admiral Byrd said before his pole flight from a base 400 miles from the pole, I'd like to see that land beyond the pole, that area beyond the pole is the center of the great unknown. After the flight, uh, radio commentaries were allegedly, during his Arctic flight of 1,700 miles beyond the pole, he reported by radio, that he saw below him, not ice and snow, but land areas consisting of mountains, forests, green vegetation, lakes and rivers, and in the underbrush saw a strange animal resembling a mammoth. And the air temperature outside the cockpit measured 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. Okay, now, <clears throat> I have only found, <laughs> I have only found... <laughs> Sorry, one. it's the clearing of the throat. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, go no. ahead. No, that's, it's, it's all good. No, I'm I, really I, sorry to interrupt, Mickey. No, but it's, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. I've only found one website in, in, everywhere, anyway, and I've gone to libraries as well. I found no paper clippings. I found no recordings of any radio shows, and I found not one shred of evidence that this actually happened. However, and I'm, I'm posting the link in now, uh, the, 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 the website link. I will read that out to you in full as well, because it's the only thing I could find. Okay, so here's the link, guys. Enjoy. Um, this is taken from the owner. So this is, this is the owner of the website here. Okay. 
At the request of a vexatious, I love the word, contributor, I am posting an item I have prepared about Admiral Byrd's 1947 and 1947 Antarctic expedition. I have the newspaper cutting from the March 5, 1947 edition of El Mercurio of Santiago, Chile. So if anybody is on the on the I'm line right now, I'm googling, I'm yahooing, I'm getting everything yeah. going. I'm seeing. Like so, so if anybody has the newspaper. El Mercurio of March 5, 1947. I don't know if there was an evening or morning edition, maybe both. If anybody has that, I want it. Okay, Santiago, Chile. That's, that's where it was published. It is in Spanish. If any reader requires a passage in the original language, I will supply it. I have contacted the website. I have not received an answer yet. So we will see what happens there. I'll keep you posted. The translation, I'm, I'm quoting again, the translation is my own. The article is the only known report of an interview given on board Mount Olympus on the high seas to Lee Van Etta, who must have been the reporter. Uh, Admiral Byrd gave two news conferences to the International News Service. Again, I have not found them on the subject of his abandoned mission, but neither conference was ever reported elsewhere. So if anybody has got any evidence that corroborates what I'm saying here, I would love to see it. Now, apparently the article runs three longish columns from which the, uh, the, the host of the website has extracted the main parts. The mission. Operation High Jump was an Antarctic expedition led by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. Its stated duration was to be up to six months. The headquarter of the ship was Mount Olympus. Besides an aircraft carrier, there were 13 other warships and supply ships and a large number of aircraft and 4,000 servicemen. This was by far the largest Antarctic expedition ever mounted. After only two months, it was abandoned and the entire force returned to the United States. That was okay. the story. That was as well. Well, it, well, it was some of the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. the reported interview, but this is not the official story either. No, uh, that's another show though. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the reported interview with Admiral Byrd goes thusly: From what he is reported to have stated, one senses that Admiral Byrd's balance of mind was slightly disturbed by something he had seen or been shown. One assumes that the purpose of the expedition was to explore Antarctica. However. Admiral Byrd said that the mission was to make some geographical discoveries, and when these had been made, the expedition would return home. And now I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from this alleged news article. The expedition completed its mission in less than two months and left the region after having made major geographical discoveries. The Admiral stated that in his opinion, the expedition had established a precedent without parallel as regards the rapidity with which the geographic discoveries were made. Here one asks, Without parallel and compar comparison to what, right? Was there some kind? Was there mm -hmm. some kind of timetable? Who knows? Okay. Another quote: As regards the recently terminated expedition, Admiral Byrd said the most important result of the observations and discoveries was made. Uh, well, sorry, made was the bearing which these had on the security of the United States. So whatever he discovered actually had national security implications for the United States. The admiral went on to say, and this is a quote apparently, or allegedly, <laughs> I'm, in a, I'm in a position perhaps better than any other person to realize the significance of how to use the scientific knowledge in these explorations because I can make comparisons. Twenty years ago I made my first Antarctic expedition. If he was making comparisons between now and then, that would indicate that something changed. Yeah, something changed, right? So, so if he must be the best person to qualify. So I, I, I'm just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise there would be no point in making such a comparison, right? Just this exactly. Sense. It would be the same ice. Yeah, absolutely. So there must have been maybe some topographical changes. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Apparently, in 1928 to 30, he was in the area of 150 degrees to 180 degrees latitude from the pole on the Pacific side. Okay, it would be there most likely that the change would have occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, another quote. Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned today of the need for the United States to adopt protective measures and bear in mind this 1947 against the possibility of invasion after World War II, guys, of the country by hostile aircraft proceeding from the polar regions. And he says now, I don't want to scare anybody, but the bitter reality is that in the event of... <laughs> oh, sorry. ...by aircraft flying in from one or both poles. Okay, so hang on. I, I, can I bring out what, what I think is really important in there? I don't want to scare anyone... Sorry, scare anybody, but the bitter reality... Is that the in in the event of a new war, the United States would be attacked by aircraft flying in from one or both poles? He doesn't. He says aircraft. It's just flying objects. Yep. Right. Um, he's he's making an assumption that there were already there was some kind of base there because you can't launch an aircraft unless you have a base. 
of some kind. That, 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 reeks, that reeks of information as well as the other one, which is a comparison. It reeks of, of, of information. What information you have to take away from that's another show. And, and that's exactly right. So, so, but I, I need to stress very, very strongly that this was the only website which claims to have first-hand evidence of, you know, being, being the newspaper clippings, as it were, of, of this particular event. Okay, I haven't found that anywhere else. So it, 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 is this, in fact, factual? I don't know, and that's why I need you to treat it with caution. Uh, uh, if it is factual, though, it would be uh, revolutionary in our understanding of the polar regions, at the very least. You know, you wouldn't expect green, lush vegetation. You certainly wouldn't expect ele elephant-like animals grazing at, at the north or south pole, for that matter. And, um, or or yeah. anim we, we haven't found any any large um, life forms other than penguins and seals down there. So really, you know, there's, there's nothing there, yeah? Correct. And, and bear in mind that the, um, uh, the uh, polar bear is in fact that, the polar bear of the North Pole, yep. and not the South Pole. So penguins down south, polar bears up north. So that's, <laughs> and see, you're right, there are no large animals, uh, 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 except for whales, of course, but they're in the water. Um, the, the, on, the, only known, the only known information on south, the South Pole that we were taught in Australia was that there were regions of the South Pole which did have no snow coverage at all and mm -hmm. only black rock was exposed. Mm -hmm. So that was what we were taught when we were growing up, that, you know, amongst the two miles of thick ice, <laughs> two miles yes. deep of ice, there were places that had no ice or snow at all whatsoever. So that's all we were taught. And see, that still lends itself towards him flying over and seeing things. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And look, and this is this, the whole Antarctic story, and this goes into, I guess, World War II, pre-World War II, end of World War II, and Nazi technology... Um, bases uh, in the South Pole in, in South America. It goes into potential lost civilizations and technology that may have been found there, and maybe even entrances to the inner world. I don't know. Okay, so, but it's a different show. I, I just need you to understand that there is something not quite right at the poles. Okay, it's it's not an area we often go to. It is not an area that is uh, densely populated uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It is extremely inhospitable and uh, people just don't go there. And even our satellite images aren't conclusive. It's, it's uh, similar to, to, to some extent, not entirely the same, but it's similar to, to what happens with the NASA pictures of the moon and, and how some of the shots seem doctored. So I don't know. I really, this is a topic which makes me uncomfortable because I have no firm evidence to offer you only speculation, entirely speculation, and, and some of the evidence may or may not be real, uh, specifically the one about Admiral Byrd and his testament, or his, his testimony. Testimony, exactly, sorry, not testament, well, he's dead. But uh, well, it's not, <laughs> it is his testament now, what else? I, I, I suppose you're right. But look, no, 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 I, I misspoke. Uh, it is, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> you, you, can, you, can, you can do that. So, um, yeah. remember, the reason why this comes up is because of, the open poles theory, right? That there is, that, that, you know, it's not just a solid sphere, that it's hollow. If it's hollow, then there might be an entrance. If there's entrances, this is what we're speaking about. So are they, are they just through? And we've found that there, yeah, there's enormous caverns. In fact, there's caverns, caverns in the Earth's crust alone, which are absolutely enormous. And there's a crystal cave, and there's... You know, you can drive just not to trucks through, but they, they go on for miles. There's, if that's just in a crust, what's below? Right? Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, Jules Verne wrote a story about, you know, you find an entrance, you end up going to the, the centre of the earth, and there's creatures, right? Um, you've got the, the, the poles themselves being entrances to the hollow earth, and the same as the moon, that's why NASA crashed their spaceship into the the what they believe, you know, this, what, what may, sorry, may have been believed to have been the entrance to it, see if it were broke and they, find, they found water ice there. So, look, we're, we're not excluding this stuff, right? We're not, we just want to show you that, you know what, when you start to, to dig, this is what you find. This is the, the things that have been reported.
Yes, and it, it, it's it's look at the very least today's show is an exercise in keeping an open mind. Okay, and I know people will deride us and they will make fun of us for bringing this to to you, but it is important as Dave said. Okay, there are people that have different ideas, and and I think after looking at it, I mean, there's there's certainly some merit to it because we we just don't know. And I, I feel it's arrogant to dismiss someone out of hand without having proof positive, right? Of course, you want to, you want to stay as, as rational, whatever that means, as you can. But uh, at one point, you have to admit that you just don't know. And, and I think a lot of scientists, I think, I think only are too arrogant to do that. And uh, Dave and I certainly are not, because we know very little. <laughs> we know, in fact, in fact, it was, it was. Uh, uh, Are you keeping uh, something from me? Have you been in the center yeah. of the earth? It was, it was uh, Socrates who said that um, um, I, I know nothing, and, and the Oracle of Delphi said he's the smartest guy in the world. So uh, there's, there's, there's benefit, uh, and there's certainly uh, humility in admitting that you don't know something. And when you know um, everything, you know nothing. Exactly. But, but just bear in mind that, that we do live in an expanding universe, according to the theory. Uh, expansion is uh, all around us. <laughs> um, it's, it, 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 would argue for, uh, it would argue for potential you know, of, of expanding planets, hollow planets. Mm -hmm. It's all possible. The moon did ring like a bell. We didn't make it up. It's there. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and, and this is where I would like to leave the discussion of that particular. There's, there's one more item we need to cover. Um, unless, Dave, you, you have something burning. No, 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 tell me. Okay, cool. So there's actually a news article uh, I picked up, which is, which is uh, sort of, I guess, uh, going into the same vein as what we've been discussing. Uh, the, the scientific paradigm is changing constantly. Okay, this news article is from 2011. In fact, it's from uh, February 22, 2011, so it's, it's a little bit older than a year, okay? And essentially, it was published for National Geographic News. You can look it up yourself. That's it's all good. We'll post the link in. I'm going to give it to you at length because it's important to understand the implications, which we'll discuss as well. The more new planets we find, and this is not the article, the less we seem to know about how planetary systems are born, according to a leading planet hunter. With a tally of confirmed planets orbiting other stars now at more than 500, so mm -hmm. five, okay, so these are called exoplanets, meaning outside our solar system, okay. A planet hunters are heading for the golden age of discovery, said Jeffrey Marcy of the University of California, Berkeley. Okay, and uh, you can explore him um, at, at length at, at your own leisure. Uh, but that bonanza has been a headache for theoreticians, he says, because many of the newly discovered star systems defy existing models of how planets form, emphasis added by the reader. Okay? So, defy <laughs> existing models. Yeah. Okay, that's where we are. Right. Current theory holds that planets are made from disks of gas and dust left over after star birth. In our solar system, it's long been thought that the large gassy planets such as Jupiter and Saturn initially took shape in the far reaches and then migrated inward as gravitational drag from leftover gas and dust eroded their orbits. Sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. The migration process halted when most of the gas and dust had been swept up to make various objects, leaving the planets more or less where we find them today. Makes sense, too. In theory, other stars with planets should have gotten similar stars, because guess what? We're living in, the universe, in a universe with the same, or we think, physics everywhere. The same rules, guys. The same rules everywhere. That's at least our thought. Ha not having gone beyond the solar system, that's a pretty big statement. But <laughs> well, yeah. There we are. Okay, so, but according to Marcy, theory has implications not borne out in reality. Implication number one. All planetary orbits should be roughly circular. Uh, are you familiar with the plane of the ecliptic? Now, the plane of the ecliptic is, is the plane in which planets move around the sun. It's, okay. the, it's the, um, the equator of the sun's Correct. rotation Correct. spread out through the solar system. Correct. Now, the article goes on to say, it's possible some planets are born with eccentric orbits. Sure. Moving around their stars and elongated ovals and, and, and similar uh, uh, orbits. But as the migrating planet spirals closer towards the star, gravitational drag should smooth out its orbit like an object circling a drain, Marcy said. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. It, it's just smoothing, like 
Think of water flowing over a rock and eventually it will smooth out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, the eight planets of our solar system all have roughly circular orbits. And models of planet-forming disks suggest most other star systems should do the same or should you know, be likewise. In reality, though, and this is Uh-oh. <laughs> only about one in three of the known exoplanets, remember the planets outside the solar system, has a circular or near-circular orbit. Whoa, what happened there? So obviously something is not quite right. Okay, so th- that means we are in the 30% of, of, of... We're the irregularity. We, in fact, we are the irregularity, 100% corrected. Okay, so bear that in mind. Implication number two. With minor exceptions, everything in the star system should orbit in the same plane and in the same direction. We just spoke about the equator on the sun yeah, in the same direction as well. Okay, now... The, and this is where the article is actually wrong. Uh, the eight planets of our solar system orbit in the same direction along what's called the ecliptic. That is incorrect. That's, in fact, Venus is orbiting in the other way. Okay? A flat plane that's nearly aligned with the sun's equator. This is the article. This makes sense if planets take shape inside the flat disk of material that rotate around newborn stars. Okay? So, it's interesting that the, planet, that the article got this wrong. But, but anyway, there we are. Models are based on the notion that gravitational drag in these disks is the main influence on planets as they migrate. Based on this theory, planets should stay in the ecliptic and continue to follow the star's rotations. Yes, but it doesn't. However, about one in three exoplanets' orbits are misaligned. Okay, some orbit in the opposite directions of the star's rotations, like Venus in our case, and others are tilted out of the ecliptic like weather satellites crossing over Earth's poles rather than the equator. So it gives a bit of a picture there, right? Now, implication number three. Neptune-sized planets should be rare across the universe. Right, fair enough. Theories of gas drag also say that planets between three times Earth's mass and Jupiter's mass should be relatively rare. Okay, that's, that's the theory of gas drag. Um, that's because models suggest that migration speed is proportional to the mass of a planet, uh, which was stated by uh, astronomer Alessandro Morbidelli of the uh, Labradori Cassiopeia in Nice, France. Planets smaller than Earth can easily survive in the disk because they migrate slowly. Planets between an Earth's mass to a Uranus mass migrate so fast that they should be engulfed by the central star. Planets that grow fast enough to become a gas giant eat up all the gas around them, slowing their migration speeds and giving them a chance to survive. Based on what planet hunters are finding, though, okay, Marcy argues that there are too many Neptune-sized worlds for this theory to be right. The size range where there should be the fewest planets, 3 to 15 times the size of Earth, are actually the most common. So hmm. it's not just a little bit wrong, it's very wrong out here. Planets essentially smaller than this are still too hard to detect for accurate statistics. Now, the, the other thing is that what that didn't mention was their rotational spin axis Yes. as well. And Uranus is at 99 degrees. Mm-hmm. It's almost, uh, it's, no, it's just past 90 degrees. So it's completely on its side as it rotates around. Now, they still can't work out why, and theory suggests, and this is even a never a straight answer, sorry, NASA, uh, explanation <laughs> is that there was a rogue planet that came through during our early creation and tipped it on its side, smashed into the Earth, but don't forget that. And that's why our iron core is larger, and also that happened to Mercury. Mm-hmm. Mercury is almost all iron, which that doesn't make sense either, being so close to the sun, that might that much mass that close to the sun. And if you were to actually see it in, in real life or to scale, it's too close to the sun. It's like being too close to the heater, right? Yes. It yes. really doesn't make sense how it could form, a planet that small could form so so close with that much mass in it, right? So the same thing. Why is Uranus, and I will always pronounce it that way, <laughs> why is Uranus tipped on its side? Well, really, something looks like it's tipped it on its side. And if you look at the, the gas drag, um, J- Jupiter is the closest gas giant to it. And if it had formed outside of Uranus's orbit and came in, it 
could have had an effect on that uh, through the, uh, the the transformation of their orbits. That's but that would have moved too slow, and it would have been consumed by Jupiter. So, what the, really the a um, fast moving object coming through our solar system is really about the only explanation for that. Yes, absolutely. And sorry to 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 go on though with the article today. If the interesting. I'm thing, sorry. No, no, no. The, the interesting thing is this, because we've we've spoken about science coming to its own defense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Still, some experts aren't quite ready to give up on current theory, uh, current theories. What a surprise! I agree wholeheartedly that the statistical distribution of planets that models produce is different from the population that we see," said Hal Levison, a planet formation theorist from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. The problem, he said, now this is this is a, 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 a workman blaming his tools. The problem, he said, is that the theory is so math intensive that a single detailed simulation can take months of computer time. You can only do a small number of simulations in the time allotted, Levson said. To run enough simulations to get a meaningful distribution of possible results, he said, it's necessary to use stripped-down versions of these models. But the quicker models come at a price, and their failure to match exoplanet reality doesn't necessarily mean theory is wrong. Now, I I'm sorry, and I, I don't want to get personal with anyone, but that sounds like a cop-out if I've ever heard it, right? I mean, the theory is there. Predictions by the theory were made. Our actual findings, our actual findings have contradicted those theories. So in my mind, okay, it's time to throw those theories out and think of something new. That, that is what I'm thinking here. I'm yeah. sorry. No, I'd be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's probably the smartest thing I've heard tonight. Uh, the, the, hard, the hard part about all this is that we're, we're in a car on the other side of the freeway while we try to predict the movements of the cars from a single photograph on the other side traveling in the other direction. Does that make sense to you guys? That's the hard part. Am I making sense? So if you were in a car going on one on, on you know, a four-lane freeway on one side of the freeway, is four lanes, the other side's got four lanes going the opposite direction. If you take a single photo, you're trying to estimate the position relative, the speed relative to the other cars and work out where they're going. And that, that's almost impossible. And that's a theory. Remember, mm -hmm. theories are theories unless they're proven, and they're not proven unless they're fact, unless you can, you can produce facts. So, you know what? This whole show is very tough to get your head around. Yes. <laughs> the, you know, it, it is, it is. There, is. there is very little. I mean, what I wanted to do was, was open you up to the concept that has been bounced around quite a lot. Because, because whenever you talk about... See, even in conspiracy circles, you, you have... Uh, and I, I guess I put as the alternative knowledge, you know, but I, I put the conspiracy... Uh, rather than theory, I talk about conspiracy fact here. There is a corner... Where where most people put the hollow earthers, <laughs> and it's it's like at a at a dance or or school uh, prom where you have got you know the um, wallflowers. Yeah, the wallflowers and, and the and the uh, and the uh, uh, the people that don't dance with anybody and just just eat cake sit. Um, <laughs> and it's a bit like that, okay? Nobody asks them to dance; they just sit by themselves. Having said that, though, I mean. There is some merit to this. I mean, don't forget, it was Edmund Haley who discovered the comet uh, that we every 72 years, right? Remember that? Yep, good. And it was him who actually started this ball rolling, more or less, with his, uh, uh, his uh, the theory that there might be uh, spheres inside the Earth that are solid rather than liquid, like we believe today. And we're just believing it today. I mean, that's our belief today. Back then, he thought, well, it makes more sense if they're solid to explain the magnetic field. And specifically, the movement of the magnetic field. Okay, this was born out of science. On top of that, you have these um, ancient legends. You have these uh, these stories that have survived. You know about some kind of underground, I guess, installations, civilizations. Who knows what? And, and let me just say this to to sort of top this uh, topic off, and then we'll have a bit more of a general discussion. Um, I have no doubt, and I, and I don't think Dave has any doubt either that there are large cavernous spaces in the Earth. Okay? Mm -hmm. It would be foolish to assume there are, because we know there are huge caves. And I would further postulate that some civilizations may very well have utilized those spaces, maybe built them out like we are doing today. We have the underground railway. We have tunnels. We have underground bases, military and otherwise. The Haldon Collider is all underground. 
for several kilometers. Okay? And it's absolutely huge. It's massive, right? It's and it's a it's one of our greatest scientific installations. So having something underground is not a far fetched thing. We spoke about the cities that are underground. Göbekli Tepe, sorry, not Göbekli Tepe, but but the the, uh, the the cities in Turkey, for instance, that mm-hmm. kept up to thirty thousand people up to 50,000, I think, even at once. But that's a lot of people underground in primitive conditions, or well, maybe not so primitive for most. The pyramids have underground chambers, okay? Most ancient structures had some kind of underground environment for whatever purpose. Okay? Yeah, which is still yet to be explained. 100%. And at <laughs> their point, we have only drilled 12.3 kilometers into the crust, the crust itself being 70 kilometers thick as, at its thickest. So we haven't even gone through the crust to see if we're right and there is something liquid. Well, we know there's magma. We, we certainly know that. Maybe there's, there's a layer in there in the crust that, that is liquid where all the magma comes from. I don't know. But I'm just thinking, if there was a volcanic eruption, there should be a lot more magma coming out if it's filled. If, if the earth is filled with this stuff, why isn't it flowing all about, right? Uh, anyway, that's just me. Hang so, on. Go ahead, go ahead. No, but I'm just, I'm just making a point here that there's a lot of things that don't add up, and I'm sure that people can explain it away, but I, I want proof positive. I want evidence. I'm the doubting Thomas. I need to see, touch, feel, smell here, the evidence for myself. I'm not satisfied with theory. Yeah, so, so let's keep an open mind and see what it leads us to. Sorry, Mike, go ahead. No, it's all good. Look, I, one thing that I wanted to bring up was... Um, I saw the head of NASA. Now, the, sca- the name escapes me, but someone can Google it and pop it in the chat for me if you like. Uh, I saw him in an interview on TV. He was over in Australia talking to the people from the University of New South Wales because his, I think, nieces he advertised that went there or stepchildren. I, I don't quite remember his relation to them. Now... Thank you, yes, the head of NASA, of course. And now, um, no, no, I'm looking for it. <laughs> I know, head, head of NASA, I like that. Um, what, what he was discussing to a, a, a consortium of people was... Michael Griffin, maybe? Was, who was it? Michael Griffin? Uh, I don't know. If I saw a photo or something. Anyway. All right. Um, so what he was talking about, he was talking about NASA's work. He gave a short spiel about NASA's history. He showed... Uh, I think it was Apollo 14 or 15 or something like that, a photo from the moon. It was color photo. It showed the color of the dirt with a blacked-out sky. One of the people in the, in the consortium put their hand up and goes, why, why is the sky black and there's no stars? And he came up with this, the silliest thing I've ever heard from the head of NASA, who was also a project specialist on one of the, nah, the shuttle missions. He said it's because the, the orbiter goes around... The Earth every 45 minutes and then jumped to something else. What? That doesn't stop the sky from having stars in it at all. In fact, with no atmosphere, we all know that there be many more stars and possibly even colour fields of being able to see brilliance in, in the solar system, sorry, in the, in the universe. However, what he then went on to talk about, this is what I'm getting at, he once someone asked him about the moon, and he said, yes, yes, oh, we, yeah, we've, we've sent two satellites up there uh, right now, and they're chasing each other around the moon in a polar orbit, uh, slightly off-centre, so it'll, it'll map the surface. And they're going to be up there for years. But what, what he said was, they're called ebb and flow. Look for this stuff, it's really cool. One of the the satellite, they're chasing each other. So when the one in front goes down, it means the gravitational forces are increased. When it lifts up in its orbit and goes to a higher elevation away from the planet's surface, the moon we're talking about, it'll report that it was less gravity. And it's going to do this thousands of times and go around and make a nice map of the moon. Eloquent, I suspect, in some way. However... One of, and thank you, whoever you were in the crowd who put their hand up and asked, so what are you looking for with those two satellites? And he said, we want to peer through the crust to see what, if anything, is there. That yes, is his yes, words. Yes, I remember. What, that. if anything, was there. Yes. Right? They know it's hollow. 
they sent two things up there to see what kind of mass there was. Now, if they get equally equal, um, eyes, equalized readings of the entire um, gravity, specific gravity around the surface of the moon, it means it's a shell to something and definitely they're on the right track. Why they would do that if they haven't been back to the moon, if you believe all of the other stories about the hollow moon concept, not just that it was it's artificial, right, if you believe it's artificial, or we believe that we've been told not to go back, or, you know, whatever it happens to be, why are we doing that? Maybe they said you can't land on it again. We don't know. I've even seen stuff out there now that talks about, you know, there's, for the elite, there's moon bases and Mars bases and everything like that, but they won't let us, like, going on the ground is bad, whatever it is, whatever there was meant to be in our destiny in the future, I think some people understand what that is. Oh, my goodness, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you saying? Um, <laughs> so he's typing in the chat, everyone who's listening, and if you listen to this on YouTube, you know, um, well, what, what, what you what just type, missed out. Yeah, sorry, what, what I'm talking about, tell me this. The Sterne neigen sich, sie zwingen nicht. My grandmother used to say that. And uh, Sorry, there was a bit of a chat going on around uh, astrology. The dark side. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the forbidden signs. Um, now, it means the stars will uh, uh, um, lean towards you. They won't force you to do anything. It's her uh, her theory, and she was very much in astrology. So, sorry, guys, that was just what I wrote there, so you know what it is. So, it's next to nine, so it's like, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so, look, I was really, when I heard him, like, it, you, you give someone some rope and they'll do something, right? And I think that what he said gave everything away. Poignant words from someone who is supposed to be the head of NASA. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually admit this too. I commented to myself on how poorly the images displayed any kind of detail whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And this is the head of NASA. Mm -hmm. If you would imagine, if the head of NASA was going to give a demonstration at some place, especially another university, you know, you're going to get, you're going to be, you know, uh, farming for funds somewhere, right? And in inspiring people who are going to university, why would you be showing really poor resolution photographs? He's got, he's got his hands, he has the ability to get any photograph from ev ever, right? Mm -hmm. Why were they low resolution? Why were they even, you know, pixelated? You'd, you'd want to show off, wouldn't you? You'd want to show off and give the best quality picture you can, wouldn't you? I would absolutely imagine he'd have high definition photographs, you know, full, um, mm. full photographs, full color photographs of whatever he wanted to provide. And you know what, he didn't. And I and I thought, you know what, you just let yourself down. You left the whole billions of dollars worth of research, and you get pixelated photos. What? <laughs> That's money well spent. Oh, <laughs> it's no wonder the shuttle program was stopped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to do a show on that one day. I, I, every time we have an idea, I, I write down that we should we should Absolutely. do some kind of research into this stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, the thing is this, okay? Most most of these guys that are out there making the rules and t keeping information from us think we're fools. Okay, they think we're the great unwashed and, and cattle and, and don't really know that. I mean, it, it's insulting. I'm not, I'm not even angry. I'm insulted. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm insulted our, that our collective intelligence is not enough to see through this. Okay, the assumptions are, look, they're dumb enough. They believe anything. They'll buy some more McDonald's. Well, well I shouldn't mention the names. <laughs> they buy some more fast food and good for them. You know, they're going to watch the next reality show and their brains will slowly run out through their ears. But... Uh, <laughs> That's a whole different show. Uh, Absolutely. Like, I, I wish we were in some, some position to mention a product name and then just get boxes of it, but, you know, we're not. <laughs> but, but, but what we are in a position to ask for as well, and hey, don't forget, this is a, a listener-funded station, and if, if, if you've got a couple of dollars to spare um, to, to continue mm -hmm. this kind of entertainment, like, let's, let's put it that way, where we try to entertain as well as, in, in lift your knowledge base up and, and get you researching. We know we're all here for a reason. We know we're listening to this stuff for a reason. There's something in, inherent in us that's gravitated us towards that, mind the pun, for today's show, to this stuff. If you find this on YouTube, if you, if you stumble upon us because of something else, you end up on, on Shiny Side Out or you end up on Freedom Slips, look, it's a great station. Please support it. There's a donate page. Go there and find our show name, Shiny Side Out. Please don't forget us. 
Hey. There's, there's one thing though, Amanda Mays from the chat room just mentioned it. I, yeah, I think it's, it's well worth it. It's, it, it says, or she says, or he, or he, he. And I can see the horseshoe nebula, but this moon here is a little blurry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, a, this is an excellent point. I mean, the Hubble telescope, the images that are coming in from that are stunning. I want to put them up as wallpaper all around my room. <laughs> okay? Only... Who knows? They're probably photoshopped. Yeah. <laughs> It's all, it's all Photoshop. It's not even any detail from the from the real universe in there, right? Uh, artist's impression, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but but it's, it's a good point to make. I mean, we can look billions of light years that direction, but we're not quite sure to get the detail on the moon. Yeah, that's that's uh, eluding us. You know, if they could, if they turned it, if they turned it towards there, and despite the moon being in shadow. Mm. Uh, and in light and not being over contrast, which was their one of their explanations that Jose led, gave us, um, was that in fact they could probably zoom up to a single footprint. Yeah. Right? That would be... Hey, think, think, think about Google Earth here for a second, please. Right? Yeah. Google Earth, hello. This is a private company. They've mapped the planet. Well, well <laughs> some areas are grayed out, oddly enough. But or photoshopped. Or photoshopped. Or... And in fact, some some display things I have no idea what they are. But the point is, <laughs> there, there it is. Let's do the same thing with the moon, the really close, whatever. It's, what, it's, I, I'm going to I'm going to ask you, like, if there's trillions of dollars spent to to gra- uh, take all the photos, like like Jose said, yes. why, why do they end up in low resolution? Why is there not yes. an application yes. to display? It? And if because if it's just a dead rock up there, right? Yes, there's nothing to hide, is there? Absolutely. What, no, what's that I, hide? You tell me. Well, nothing. Obviously, maybe, maybe it's just, it's just, it's too boring for us to see in high resolution. Who knows? You know, maybe every single school kid opening up a textbook would want to see this. Yes, they want to see. Did, didn't you want to see it, everybody? Didn't we want to see it? Of course we did. We were fascinated by this. I was always, you know, I mean, you, it's, it's, it's one of those amazing, mind-blowing things when you're a child. You know, we, we are. Well, some of us were born into an era that, where space flight was a real thing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean. The first generation for most of us that, that, that did that. And it's an astonishing thing. Uh, what has happened to it, though, is a travesty. Uh, it really upsets me greatly. It was, it was meant to be the public information. It was meant to be everything we've ever wanted. But then it became so secret. And, you know, I, I did. I, <laughs> I, I, that's, yeah, Hobie's got the, the answer for that. So <laughs> that's only because it was in a studio. Oh, um, yes. but, uh, look, I, like, I like the thing about the moon where it's in a studio and it's, uh, the only reason was, I like the new explanation for it being filmed in a studio, was because they didn't want the star field out there. They didn't want the UFOs that were on the, on the side of the crater to be, <laughs> to be filmed. You know, nothing accidental, guys. Yes. Hey, Tone, yeah, I mean, look, 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 Tones, Tones is just called in. Hi, hey, hey. shiny side out, baby, shiny how side are you? out. What's going on? <laughs> how are you keeping tones? How's things? Let's just send up two big spotlights on the back, on the dark side of the mood and light that sucker up already, would you? You know, that's Don't actually that. the funniest thing I've ever heard. Because, you know, just, when, <laughs> when, when, when it's dark for us, it's light for something else, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> the moon is full of beautiful color. <laughs> Beautiful, glorious color. You guys are great, man. I love you guys. Uh, you know, so much content. It's just an, uh, an onslaught. It's a gamma ray of intel from, from you both. Two hours is not enough. Um, I had something to ask you because I, I read something recently. I got into, uh, a, and it's, you know, it's a bunch of the topics that you cover tonight. And it's, it's a lot to do with everybody's bug out of the whole heavy mass object things mm-hmm. coming around and orbits things going around. Okay. So I read this up on Philip Pl- uh, Plate. Um, and he, and he, and he goes into this, you know, 65 million years ago, the, di- the dinosaurs had a bad day. Uh, you know, six mm-hmm. mile wide asteroid hit the Yucatan you know, Peninsula. Asteroids, uh, that size don't come around that often, obviously. And, um, you know, the the force of that had basically if we took all the new nuclear bombs throughout history one 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 millionth of the energy of that mm-hmm. astro- uh, that asteroid that hit so in 2005 NASA launched a probe deep impact which slammed into a piece uh, of a comet into in, into a comet basically and um, pretty pretty much comet ast- asteroid and whatnot uh, the purpose wasn't so much to push it away from its orbit to get into the crater and excavate it to see what material was underneath it to surface. And that comet, you know, is orbiting around the sun 10 to 20 miles per second. 
And mm -hmm. NASA was able to hit that. How good is that? Okay, so now now a nuclear weapon wouldn't be good good because of the timing and it has to be so precise within milliseconds and all that kind of stuff. But if you could change the orbit, you could potentially and put it through a different keyhole, you could buy time from three months to three years and then re examine the situation again. Oh, well, we're talking. I, the, the, there's a um, an asteroid in which you are referring to that come pa comes past, and I said 16 or something, and we'll revisit again if it hits the keyhole, but it'll be a direct hit on the next pass. Well, right. So, so yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if we see an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth, we can potentially hit it to move it slightly out of its orbit to a better orbit. But then what he goes on to say is that he, we can launch a probe that has a weight of a couple tons, doesn't have to be huge, and you could park it near the asteroid, but don't land on it. Cause Gravitationally influenced. Ten, ten, right, right. And, and then, you know, it's hard to land on so you have to get near it. And then the gravity of the asteroid pulls onto the probe, and the probe has a couple of tons of mass, but it, you know, it does have a little tiny bit of gravity, but it's enough that it could pull the asteroid, and it couldn't use chemical rockets. It would have to be an ion drive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. slowly and slowly potentially pull it away. So the whole thing about this heavy mass object business coming in to crush us, we can we have the issue to solve it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The, question, the question is though, it, does does the does the power lead want to solve the problem? Right. That, that is the question. Like we spoke about this some sometime earlier. The, the, the awareness to skate, Dave and I are coming our way with more people on the planet than ever. I think. I think, and I'll be honest with you, Tones. I think they want a whole bunch of people to die. Be it through the heavy mass object, be it through some kind of viral outbreak, whatever it might be. That is on the cards. If it's bad enough for them to be wiped out, I'm sure they're going to do something about it. Though. <laughs> well, I mean, the, if yep. Go yeah, ahead, I'm go ahead. sorry. No, yeah, I'm I, just saying, if they're connected by their own gravity, if you move that probe slowly enough and gently enough, you can move the asteroid into a safer orbit. And then from there, big shots, if you want to go mine your asteroid, go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. But it, all it is is iron, right, for the most part. So right. we've got a lot of that here. And unless we have a metal shortage where we, you know, if we discover another, if we start using carbon fire to build buildings, we get a whole bunch of iron. We don't care. Right, because we'll just reuse it. Like, like the NBN, we're we're going fiber here, and we're going to pull up all the copper and melt it, and use it for something else. So, right. if we can That's find it. an alternate for it, yeah, we're okay. But you know what? For the destruction component, if there was a heavy mass object, think about the percentage of difference of influence, right, that it takes to move a, a twenty mile Phobos or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. Compared, because it's a couple of tons to to 20 tons or whatever it is, or 200 tons or whatever, however large the thing is. But a heavy, a hev the heavier the object, the more influence you must apply to it. But that percentage is changed depending on how much lead time you have. Right. So right? I wanted to, to, to think about the next thing, which would be cymatics and, the so and, and, and sound influencing the changing of the position of things. Mm-hmm. Where we could potentially move, could could we move us? No, no, no. Sorry, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, <laughs> no, no, you could, you could, you could, you can. But but it would be catastrophic for us uh, to be That's, moved. We yeah. have we have issue with that. So so yes yes we we could potentially move the Earth, but uh, anything that would take it slightly out of its orbit. Uh, would uh, would be would the Earth itself would survive, but the the forces that would be required and in fact unleashed upon the surface of the Earth would be more devastating than the impact or the the Correct. influence of the other object. Yeah. I, I, yeah, bear in mind the analogy of the bucket of water we gave you earlier. If you if you're running with a bucket of water and you stop, that <laughs> water keeps traveling. <laughs> okay, so essentially, if we moved the Earth any which way, in any direction, and stopped, that water would keep moving. No, no, stay on, stay on. It was great. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but we've got, okay, we've got no, three minutes. We've got three minutes yeah. at the top of the hour. It's the end of the show. We're coming up to. Yes, yes. Um, Tones, we love you on the show. Well, any time you're, you're welcome. You've All got right. a great voice, mate. You've got a great voice. I know. He's, he's the guy who should have his own show. So, um, what, what I'm... The, the hard part, the hard part about an inbound object or anything that we're going to do a show on all the things that could go wrong, 
with life on Earth, right? We want to do a show on that. It's definite, and it's just coming up. But we're getting, we're now we're getting our name out there, and, and you know what? We're, we've got we've got so many people booked up. We're going to late July now before we can start slotting in our own shows. Yeah, that's true. So it's going to be exciting. A few months coming with awesome guests. We had to we had, we, we recorded an interview this morning, in fact, which went extremely well. And we, we got a guy that, that is hard to get, we were told. We're just lucky, right place, right time. So we, we had definitely have some exciting shows coming up, guys. Well, well we, can, we can say who that was. We can? Yeah, because... Well, we, yeah, we got Lloyd Pye. I think we, we mentioned that. And, and I, right. I've been... I actually met him when he was in Australia. I listened to his talk on the Nexus conference. Uh, read his books. I was fascinated by everything he knows wrong. A very interesting take on evolution and, and, and general, um, I guess, scientific knowledge filters that are being applied. And he was a fantastic guy to chat with. He really was. He was uh, full of good humor and, and, and amazing information. So you, you're going to love that when it goes to air, but we're trying to find a slot for that. And, yeah, that's right. And, and the best time that we've got is probably the 9th, uh, sorry, you know, the 9th of June or yes. the, 10th, the 10th. If you're 9th in, in L.A., 10th the rest of the world. All right, because the date changes when it when it leaves LA. So, um, what are we talking about next week, Dave? What's, do we have someone on? Us? Yeah, we do. We have Judy Carroll. She's an author. She's uh, is, she's an author of Human by Day, Zeta by Night, and uh, Zeta Talk, All right? And Zeta Talk as well. Uh, she's an awesome get. Uh, she's an experiencer herself. That's what got her involved in the whole business. And it's going to be. A whole show on UFOs and aliens, guys. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we'll have. Oh, I think we're right near the end. So uh, we'll advertise the next, the, all the people, in the next shows coming up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on another episode of Shiny Side Out with Dave <laughs> and Mackie. Yeah, thank you, guys. Catch you on the flip side. Absolutely. Well, the music hasn't started yet, so I'm sort of just. <laughs> Someone's off stage doing the... You know,